Welcome to Lights, Camera, Exploitation, your guide to exploitive cinema. This is the pod boss, TJ Bowser, and joining me as always is my doppelganger, Kanga Banger, from down under, Mr. Brody Kane. Howdy, howdy, my mateys. And Mr. Risky Business himself, Nick Reese. Risky Business. What's up, dudes? <laughs> Today, we have a doozy of an episode, but first, you know what time it is. It's time for your slice of life. Brody, how goes it? It all goes, mate. It all bloody goes. Um, yeah, like I say, every goddamn week, working flat out as per usual. Usual. Um, actually, kind of a boring week this week. We didn't really get up to much other than that. Uh, uh, watched a bo- shit ton of fucking films as per usual. Yeah, um, buddy. Yeah. Oh, The Evictors, uh, a 1979 film, uh, rocked up on my doorstep yesterday from the very, very exquisite Screen Factory. So, uh, very, very excited to watch that indeed. Um, but yeah, yeah, not much happening with me down in the these neck of the woods there, mate. Uh, what about you, Slick Nick? Not a ton. Um, co-host on Beetle Bros. Cameron's birthday was this week, so we went out, played its top golf, played some golf like the rich white guys that we are not. Um, <laughs> uh, really, the only movie I've watched this week, other than this film that we're discussing, is uh, I watched Hitchcock last night, or Hancock. Sorry, not Hitchcock, Hancock. <laughs> <last night. laughs> that would have been a much different movie than what I watched. Because <laughs> why? the hell not that movie's fun as hell uh but yeah i mean that's really about all i've been up to this week it's been pretty quiet up here too man what about you tj what you've been doing well as i say every week podcast here podcast there podcast everywhere dropped a bunch of gore more episodes on wednesday and i made my return to the stream on monday yeah that was pretty cool we dropped our episode last week and i want to say shout out to the country of niger for completely blowing us away and keeping us in your podcast charts all week and yeah thank you so Hell yeah. fucking much. Hell yeah. But yeah, I got uh, Criterion scanners today. That will be coming on Ooh. Monday. We're still waiting for our vinegar syndrome orders to ship, but my diabolic DVD uh, orders did come. So I got Strike Commando 1 and 2, and then I got the uh, Years of Lead box set from Arrow, uh, the Stylist from Arrow. Fantastic film. The box set is exquisite, and Strike Commando is off its fucking head. And I'm going to announce it now. That is one of the films for this season, and we will be doing it in a couple weeks so stay tuned for one of the craziest films that you've ever watched the behind the scenes are just as fun but yeah, yeah, yeah. but for like first time watches uh, this is the first time i watched this film and i'm excited to really uh talk about this black exploitation classic so let's get this episode started this week's film is 1971 shaft you want to take it out of your ass pip <laughs> For a nigga named John Shaft. We just found him. Wow. The mob wanted Harlem back. They got Shaft up to here. All I'm asking you is to let me know what's going on. No names, no places, just what? Okay, Tom, use up your minutes. Get out. Don't tell me, man. Where the gun? Look here. than Bond, cooler than Bullet. Rated R. If you want to see Shaft, ask your mama. 
And that is by director Gordon Parks, who also did The World of Peary Thomas in 1968, Shaft's Big Score in 1972, and The Super Cops in 1974, and Moments Without Proper Names in 1987. Writers Ernest Tidyman, who also wrote the Shaft novel. He also wrote The French Connection in 1971, High Plains Drifters in 1973, and To Kill a Cop in 1978, and Stark in 1985. Cinematographer Urs Furr, who also did The Fat Black Pussycat in 1963, The Sidelong Glances of a Pigeon Kicker in 1970, Been Down So Long It Looks Up to Me in 1971, and Where's the Lily Blooms in 1974. Costume design by Joseph D. Alusi, who did Death Wish in 1974, Die Hard with a Vengeance in 1995, Charlie's Angels in 2000, and The Pink Panther in 2006. Producers Joel Freeman and David Golden, budget $500,000. Starring! Richard Roundtree as John Shaft, who was also in Maniac Cop in 1988, George of the Jungle in 1997, and Speed Racer in 2008. Also features Moses Gunn as Bumpy Jonas, who also stars in Rollerball in 1975, Ragtime in 1981, and Bates Mattel in 1987. Charles Kiofi as Vic Andrazi, who was also in Mongo's Back in Town in 1971, The Thief, who came to dinner in 1973, and Amy's Orgasm in 2000. Oh. Christopher St. John as Ben Buford, who also was in Top of the Heap in 1972, The Retrievers in 1982, and The Secret Life of Kathy McCormick in 1988. Also starring Gwen Mitchell as Ellie Moore from Recess in 1969, Brother on the Run in 1973, and Chosen Survivors in 1974. Lawrence Pressman as Tom Hannon, who starred in The Man in the Glass Booth in 1975, The Hanoi Hilton in 1987, and American Pie in 1999. And lastly, Victor Arnold as Charlie who starred in The 7-Ups in 1973, All the Right Moves in 1983, and Tree Lounge in 1996. Brody, take it away. John Shaft is the ultimate in suave black detectives. He first finds himself up against Bumpy, the leader of the black crime mob, then against black nationals, and finally working with both against the white mafia who were trying to blackmail Bumpy by kidnapping his daughter. Oh, 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 what a story it is. Oh, indeed. <sighs> So let's talk about some of the awards this fucking thing won. And it's got a lot. And those are Image Awards from the NAACP in 1971. And that is the Outstanding Actor in a Motion Picture, Richard Roundtree, nominee. Outstanding Actor in a Motion Picture, Moses Gunn, nominee. The Academy Awards, United States of America, 1972. Best Music, Original Score, Isaac Hayes. Winner, winner, Chicken Dinner. Best Music, Original Dramatic Score, Isaac Hayes, nominee. The BAFTA Awards in 1972, the Anthony Asquith Award for Music, the Isaac Hayes, nominee. Golden Globes, United States of America, 1972, Best Original Score, Motion Picture, Isaac Hayes, winner, winner, Chicken Dinner. Most Promising Newcomer, Male Richard Roundtree, nominee. Best Original Score, Motion Picture, Isaac Hayes, nominee. Grammy Awards, 1972. Best Original Score, Written for a Motion Picture or a Television Special, Isaac Hayes, winner, winner, Chicken Dinner. And lastly, the MTV Movie and TV Awards from 1994 gave Richard Roundtree a Lifetime Achievement Award for the whole film series, including Shaft's Big Score in 1972 and Shaft in Africa in 1973. So, Nick? It's time to get physical. Okay, so for this week's film, it has a release from Warner Brothers from August 14th, 2012, and it features a 1080p video and audio of a DTS HD Master Audio Mono. Subtitles come in English, French, German, Japanese, and Spanish. Also features behind-the-scenes documentary called Soul in Cinema, filming shaft on location. That is in standard definition, and that is uh, what, about 10 minutes and 50 seconds. This is much better than the usual EPK-style promotional piece because it doesn't feature a hard sell voiceover, but simply provides a close look at Roundtree and Parks working on scenes, as well as Parks and Hayes developing the soundtrack, and Parks and editor Robertson working on fine-tuning the action. Also features standard definition trailers that are enhanced, and that features trailers for Shaft, Shaft's Big Score, and Shaft in America. And then we also have Shaft the Killing, 1973 TV episode. That's about an hour and 13 minutes long. This is the new extra following the release of the third Shaft film in 1973, CBS 
Comcast greenlit a TV series featuring John Shaft, which ran on Tuesday nights alternating with a series called Hawkins featuring Jimmy Stewart as a country lawyer. Neither series was a success in part because they appealed to vastly different audiences. Also, many of the qualities that made John Shaft distinct and appealing were not TV friendly. It had to be toned down. The episode ran on October 30th, 1973, follows Shaft's efforts to free an old flame from the clutches of an abusive pimp. When the pimp is found beaten to death, Chef is arrested. Chef. <laughs> Shaft is arrested for his murder. The source material is in somewhat rough shape, but Warner is to be commended for providing this supplement, which makes for an interesting contrast with the original film. It is currently region free and it's on Amazon for $11.99 United States. To be fair, Chef is a part of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boys, additional information. Yes, sir. So, Isaac Hage uh, himself was actually originally set to play John Shaft until he ended up getting replaced by Richard Roundtree. However, the producers were still impressed with him enough that they offered to have him compose the entire score, which is actually how he got that part, uh, which won him the Academy Award, as we mentioned, for Best Original Song at the 1972 Oscars making him the first African-American artist to win said award. Um, yeah, in a short clip uh, of the making of Shaft, which can be seen on YouTube, uh, director Gordon Parks talks to music composer Isaac Hayes about the music for the bar sequence. He is quoted by saying, it's a useful crowd. Music should be up source from the jukebox. The fact that there's violence at the end and a lot of action with the police coming in makes no difference to the music because... The music stays right where it is all the time. So that it does give you that feeling of being in a bar. And you'll notice that with a change of atmosphere with the actor due to the action in the scene, but the music goes right on. Oh. Fellow director Martin Van Peebles will often tell a story of how Shaft was actually originally rumored to just be written as another average detective movie for the time featuring a white lead, uh, with the film being rewritten and recast as a black exploitation film after the success of his own movie, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. However, this is not believed to be entirely true, as the novel that the movie was based on, Shaft, actually features an African-American lead already, and the principal photography for Shaft had begun months before the release of Van Peebles' movie, though he continued to tell the story for decades after it came out. As Gordon Parks watches a cut of his film with editor Hugh A. Roberts, he is quoted to say, wow, that's pretty damn exciting, especially the way it works. It's so beautifully cut and it makes me look good, Hugh. However, there was one scene where it looks like Shaft is looking up instead of down. Editor Hugh Roberts proceeds to make a note of this with his assistant and film editor Paul L. Evans. So Parks goes on to say, all I can say is thank God for good editors. I can see why you got nominated for the Midnight Cowboy. So, little bit of, uh, maybe not a continuity error, but just a slight error that I noticed that was different and I couldn't find any other movie that had this. So often in movies, when characters will use a double action revolver, an automatic pistol, uh, naming you right now Boondock Saints, uh, they will cock the hammer back before firing it as like a threat, which is completely and utterly pointless for any (laughs) automatic pistol or double action revolver, anything like that, because it will literally pull the hammer back by itself and fire it. That's the point of it being automatic. However, in Shaft, whenever he confronts the man in the plaid coat in the elevator and puts the gun to his head, he doesn't cock the hammer back, which you would think, great, except he has a 45 caliber single action pistol, meaning if he pulled the trigger, absolutely nothing would happen to him at all. So it is the only movie I've seen where they actually got the reverse of every other movie making that error. <laughs> it's the only one I can find. In an interview with Roger Ebert about exploring more into Shaft's character for future films, Parks is quoted, People come up and ask me if we really need this image of Shaft, the black Superman. Hell yes, there's a place for John Shaft. I was overwhelmed by a world premiere on Broadway. Suddenly I was this perpetrator of a hero. Ghetto kids were coming downtown to see their hero, Shaft. And he was a black man on the screen they didn't have to be ashamed of. Here they had a chance to spend their $3 on something they wanted to see. We need movies about the history of our people. Yes, but we need heroic fantasies about our people, too. We all need a little James Bond now and then. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, though it was released, 
least a few years into the beginnings of the black exploitation genre. I think some of the earlier ones I could find are about 67 or 68. Daft is widely considered to be the first feature film franchise, having spawned the said four sequels and TV series. I think it's actually five now because one just came out two years ago, um, <laughs> at least within the United States, to feature a black lead. Yes, yes. Very nice indeed. After a screening of Shaft in uh, 2014 at the Virginia Film Festival, actor Richard Roundtree was interviewed by University of Virginia historian John Mason. Discussing his time before and on film, he states, after it was announced that I had the role, Gordon said to me, but you can't say anything about this because the holiday season is coming up and it will get lost in the press to which we will announce it after New Year's. So when the time came, I remember it all being exciting, especially after being not only the centerpiece of the film, but a black star in a major MGM film was huge, mm -hmm. especially when all of the press was focusing on me. Continuing into that actually with MGM, uh, at the point in 1971, MGM was actually nearing bankruptcy wah, as pretty much wah, every movie. Wah. Yeah, rest in peace or not. <laughs> but, Didn't Jeff Bezos uh, just eat them? Uh, did he? Didn't Amazon did just buy MGM? Acquire them? I yeah, May of last year they were set to buy they bought MGM Studios for a little shy of eight and a half billion dollars. There we go. <laughs> God damn, that's a lot of money. Man, he could have got them for cheap back then because they were about to get bankrupt. Uh, apparently, the almost every single movie they released that year lost them money. The studio was saved when only three of their films that year turned a profit, Shaft being one of them when it made $12 million on a half a million dollar budget. In an interview with Robin Young, a co-host at Here and Now on the 2019 film Shaft, Richard Rantree was asked what it was like to work with original director Gordon Parks and having responsibility to play such an iconic figure in cinema. Rand Tree states, well, Gordon Parks is shaft. The way he moved, the way he talked, he's the most sophisticated, smooth person that I've ever met. And to be in his presence and to be a part of something that he has his stamp on is magical to me. Also, having played Shaft myself, I used to look at it as a double-edged sword, but I've had so many people from all over the country and all over the world actually come up and say what that film meant to them back in 71. It is heavy, and I'm appreciative of people speaking to me and sharing that with me. The other side of it is I got typecast for quite some time, and then I've gone out of my way to establish a different side of my acting. Even going to playing the first interracial gay couple married on TV. My dad said to me once he was out visiting me in LA and I was complaining about how 24-7 the Shaft character comes up and he says, son, let me tell you something. A lot of people leave this earth not being known for anything. Just shut up. Bingo! Well, that's fair enough. What? I didn't know. I didn't know he did that, that he played the first interracial gay married car, at least one half of the first interracial <laughs> game, a couple on TV. I wonder what show that was. I, I think that was uh, Shaft Gets Shaft. <laughs> 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 a little other connection to some modern cinema actually during a comic-con panel in 2012 director quentin tarantino revealed uh that the characters of his film django unchained one of my favorites of his by the way django freeman and his wife brumhilda von schaft are actually intended to be the great 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 grandparents of john shaft hence brumhilda's last name <laughs> <laughs> well, Which makes me so, so happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when asked in a 2009 interview with the Straight Times, Roundtree was asked that there was a lot of anxiety within the community about how black people were being portrayed in films and whether they promote positive in images or fed up in st into stereotypes. What that reaction warranted, to which Roundtree responded, yes, yeah, some of it, but I had the privilege of working with the classiest gentleman, possibly whom I have ever known in the industry, Gordon Parks. So that word exploitation, I take offense to with any attachment to Parks. 
that was not who he is, was or had been. And yes, I have done a couple of films that could be in that category, but my experience of what I was able to do with Gordon transcends that label. I have always viewed that as a negative who is being exploited, but it gave a lot of people work and entry into the business, including a lot of present day producers and directors. It's actually really interesting to see his take on it being an exploitation film as well. Um, yeah. So though uh, the original reception of the film, uh, at least critically, um, was generally mixed with public reception being fairly positive um, and the overall critical reception being about average to negative. Uh, Roger Ebert at the time gave the film two and a half out of four stars, though I believe he did retroactively change Roger that. Ebert! Uh, with Gene Siskel giving it an even lower score of two out of four. Um, in the year 2000, the film did end up being selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. So it did end up getting the recognition it deserved in the end. Okay, boys, let's... Mr. Fucking Richard Roundtree himself. Yeah. He's just one to love motherfucking liquor. I mean, how could you not pick him, really? Yeah, you know, he's uh, definitely the heart and soul of the film. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's, he's co- he brings a presence to the screen. It's quite exquisite to watch. Um, you know, he definitely showcases uh, leadership. Yep. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's what you need in a character like this, I find. It was, yeah, it was actually really entertaining to see that unfold on screen. Do you remember him from Maniac Cop? Well, I didn't until you mentioned it uh, today. Mm. And then it had me actually uh, triggering some uh, Vietnam flashback in the old fucking noggin so Mm -hmm. so yes even on screen uh, in uh, Maniac Cop he was pretty staunch as well speaking of uh, the old MC himself uh, Blue Underground officially announced Maniac Cop 2 and 3 4K releases in October I think it's the 13th Uh, Brody and I uh, heard about these late last year and then saw some uh, screenshots earlier this year so the hype's been building so this announcement's not like a big surprise but having an actual date just allows us to uh, prep (laughs) for (laughs) pre-orders I I, I received (laughs) my uh, Blu-ray the other day unfortunately I didn't order it in uh, 4K Mm. oh I, I held off after I heard the rumor, so I will be getting those uh, for the first time in 4K. So, yes, sir. Okay, moving on, moving on. Favorite performance, uh, Nick? Oh, I'm fucking Shaft, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to go with Roundtree, uh, especially knowing that this was his first feature film role. Uh, this was what launched his career, and this was already some of his best work. His definitely some of his most notable or at least well known work. He was doing commercials before this, mm. and he got tapped um, by Gordon just to star as chef. And he just brings this air to the character. He's oh, yeah. just always interesting to watch. No matter what he's doing. The, the beginning of the movie is just him starting walking down the street, going to talk to the guy at the newspaper stand. And already, uh, and, it, and you know, it might just be, it might be in part due to Isaac Hayes' incredible opening song for the movie. But you're already just like, I want to just watch this guy walk down the street in New York. And then he comes in and he's talking with the blind newspaper vendor and everything. And they make the joke about, oh, you guys all look the same to me because he's sitting there completely blind, staring off into space. That killed me. <laughs> but like just his performance from start to finish was just always great to watch and it amazes me that it was his first ever movie that he was just doing commercials and everything before this and that this was how he started out um what about you tj you pick someone else other than uh the man himself I mean, you really can't. There's not really uh, not a lot of focus on other characters. I like the guy who plays Ben. I think that character is pretty rad. Mm-hmm. I, I like how uh, his character evolves from kind of being like a bad guy at the beginning to kind of like being a, like an anti-hero with alongside, not with, but like alongside Roundtree's shaft. It's it's pretty cool. Uh, again, you guys you guys already talked about how awesome his performance is as shaft. He, he's such a strong, strong lead character, and it's it's so different for the time, and it's. You 
you can definitely see why this film's so important to so many people and why it had the impact it did at, at, the, at this time in America. It's yeah, it's a fantastic film and his uh, performance is fantastic. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So yeah, it's just great to watch. Yes. So favorite set piece, Brody Kane. Shaft's apartment. Yes, sir. Ooh, I love that mm. set piece style. Uh, even like, like just the brick showing, polished timber floorboards, and that spiral staircase really sets it sets the mood for that '70s style, and I fucking love it. Uh, actually, not to mention like all all of these alcohol beverages and bookshelves on display. You know, the, de- the man's definitely got some feng shui happening in there, and you know, it definitely shows more about his character. You know, I just wish we had more scenes in it, but then that would have been a fucking boring film. In saying that, I just wanted to live it and uh, and party party there Hell yeah, dude. all night and every fucking day okay He's Fra- got the full- frank white's house or shaft's house Ooh, oh, fucking oh that's mm. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm, I'm kind of because a- it's so big it's bigger for more people to come party with but if it's that's a fair. nice little warm and cozy cozy uh setting shaft's apartment yeah. i don't know there's something about fucking that new york apartments that i really love yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's like a big, gra- well, that's the thing. Shaft's apartment's a New York apartment. Uh-huh. It's just a smaller New York apartment because he's a <laughs> 70s private detective. Yes. <laughs> but like, no, I get what you're saying. I'm more of like a small group, not massive party kind of mm-hmm. guy. So like, I would totally be down to hang out at just Shaft's house. I mean, the man has a reel to reel next to his vinyl record player, literally sitting on that bookshelf, like right next to all the books and everything. Man, he's got all of it covered. <laughs> There's a lot of cool set pieces. I like his office. I think that's a really cool piece. I like mm-hmm. uh, I like the fight scenes choreographed in there. I just think that a lot of uh, important stuff happens in that office that uh, really steers the story of the film. So I'm going to go with the uh, Shaft's office for some reason. I, I thought it was really rad. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's actually really cool. Especially when they I'm came actually... back and they had the boards on the windows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Knock the guy out. Yeah. That shit was good. Uh I, I actually went with the uh with no name bar. Okay. The uh, A, I really like the name, No Name Bar. It was li- I, I, at first I thought they were just like, oh, it's some No Name Bar, and I listened back to it. And he was like, literally, no, he's at No Name Bar across the show. I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but it, it, that dark, smoky, nightlife, 70s kind of seedy bar across from his apartment, and the whole scene that just took place in there with him, like, pranking the gangsters sent to keep an eye on his apartment across the street, and he's literally got you know them turning the lights on and stuff so that the guys are looking up there and he's pretending to be the bartender serving them while secretly calling the cops to come <laughs> pick him up and everything and uh that whole interaction at the bar um with the the gay guy that walks up to him and he goes the girl over there yes the one with the um exquisite tits i believe it's called uh, she wants to talk to you uh she tried to talk to me but i was like no <laughs> i like I, I loved the whole scene from start to finish i loved the set uh i don't know it just the bar was probably my favorite it was probably one of my favorite sets of just the whole movie but i do agree his office was pretty sick especially for it just being a private detective's office and everything um but yeah no i'm gonna have to go with the bar for mine i think you answered your uh our next question as well all in that uh thanks <laughs> uh <laughs> we've done it before so I mean, <laughs> so next that's you already answered it favorite scene <laughs> or shot brody uh, yeah no, i love the uh the whole opening scene for me uh from yeah. the conversation with the two detectives and uh to when he throws you can't get a man like that down (laughs) absolutely (laughs) hell yeah dude was it just me or did i've i don't know i found that office of his very fucking claustrophobic and small i mean was it just me because i found it really tiny it wasn't big no yeah it was like a janitor's closet dressed up uh to make it look legit like (laughs) i I don't know (laughs) To be fair, the CEO at my work, his office is about the same size. It might actually be slightly smaller because like he's got like the the not vaulted, but like the diagonal kind of protruding walls a little bit next to where the window is behind his desk. You got to understand where Brody lives in the penthouse that he's used to. And then whatever he says. Yeah, Frank White's apartment, right? He just, he just, he just scoffs at this shit. Fucking something on everyone, We all got to go to your place to party now. They don't call him the king of Kalgoorlie for nothing, so. <laughs> <laughs> fucking embarrassing me. 
Yeah, you know, like I, I thought it was a great scene to kick off and set up the film. You know, it's very well paced, and um, I love just the just the top that scene off of the cherry on top is when it, uh, the old gangster spits blood all up the wall. Oh, that was <laughs> oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's a little bit over the top, but I fucking. I like how he lets like cuts his hand a little bit, and then one of his side pieces is like, "Oh, baby, I'm just gonna dab that there. It just makes you feel all right." <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, so first day kid. What about you? <laughs> so I really like the whole shootout scene at the end, them coming into the hotel, and it, like it's really really cool. I love I love that. Uh, my favorite shot is the mirror shot of Shaft's ass while he's balls deep in the honeys. Uh, that's <laughs> that's what's what's what, what you want, and especially. Oh, if, if we're going to do an exploitation film, you, you got to mention the, the crack shot. Uh, yeah, it's yes. fucking rad. But the, yeah, that whole that final whole final sequence of them going into the hotel and uh, fucking up the mafia. It's just too damn cool. And I, I like how they, like, they bring the fire hose and then just like leave it on. Just like, fuck y'all. I'm, yes. I'm flooding this floor. When they go back <laughs> out of the elevator and it's still sitting there just shooting into the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, it's so good. I love that. I actually like the little build up bit beforehand, too, when he's trying to make the explosive to throw in through the window and he's like you, yeah. you have anything that'll burn like hot or whatever and he hands in that little pint and he goes to douse it on he smells it and then he takes a sip and he goes it's gin man <laughs> <laughs> yeah fucking a man yeah so guys favorite effect or death build at the window throw is pretty much the only one that's not someone he fell caught. out he ran out that window nobody touched him yeah okay <laughs> that's f- that is a yeah. common misconception. Shaft did not touch a hair on that man's head. He ran yeah, right out that window. That makes the death even fucking better. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to suicide you. I mean, the only other cool window death is the Halloween 5 death where the uh, guy gets choked out the window. It, oh, yeah. No, that <laughs> one is pretty good. It's not bad at all. I can only think yeah. of that or uh, the IT crowd when the CEO gets caught for fraud in the boardroom meeting or whatever. And they're like, the police are here, sir. And he goes, oh, right. Yes. Send them right up. Gets up, opens, and then just hops straight up. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, eh? Yeah, so what? Yeah, I'd go with that. And, uh, not to mention, you know, you can hear the screams and sirens wailing in the background. I just thought that was a nice little touch of the scene. Usually films back then don't really um, add shit like that to it. So old mate, old mate was stepping up his uh, directing skills at this point. What about you, Slick Nick? Um, so I did, at least for the death, I also had the window. Um, at least for the effect, the only one I could think of that I just, I kind of applauded how almost, how almost realistic it really looked, at least with the sound design, uh, the, the bottle break. Yep, um, I agree. In I the agree. bar, whenever he he insults Shaft right as he's getting arrested, Shaft smashes the bottle over his head, and it's already instantly bleeding. And all the I, I was just like, oh, oh, I felt that. That was awesome, actually. That was really awesome. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, no, I just I really liked that effect for it. Um, everything else was really all fairly standard practical effects. At least it seemed to me not bad, like by any the, means. Just the, just the the, the gun exchange. The gunfire exchanges were really well done. Yeah. I think that this this film was really pretty good for the uh, the budget that it had. It's oh yeah. I mean, this ain't no Frank Henenlotter work, but it's pretty no. good. Yeah, it's, it, it just they did it very well with what they had. Yeah, yeah, especially you know, I'm assuming it's practical effects. They probably had stunt work for, but uh, building up to the hotel scene when they had shaft rappelling down. Uh-huh on the rope to get outside and everything. It was the seventies. I can't imagine they they five anything else, but so. just have a guy outside without a safety harness holding onto a rope or something for the shot. So boys, are we able to talk about story and not talk about impact or takeaways? So, so what's your thoughts on the story? Um, I mean, I genuinely, re- genuinely really enjoy it. Um, mm-hmm. at its heart, it is a private eye gets high. Like it's just so there's so many twists and turns. It's a private eye getting hired by a guy he thinks is trying to kill him that's part of an enemy like rival gang that's already been out for him and he ends up working for him and just bringing on this sort of crew um, of just additional people from like very unexpected places that he would get with like uh, Ben like you said started out as as sort of a bad guy character and then over time he warms up with Shaft they, they get closer and in the end you know they do the whole hotel I, I almost struggle to like call it it feels like a heist scene to me feels like a heist scene build up but like he does that whole thing with them he's got all of his gang and everything behind him and they all 
band together to do a good thing and rescue this guy's daughter and all of like i don't know it's just it's very unpredictable uh and i think that it was very well done and very well man written. my um, problem is why did he have to talk all that jive to him in the first place and not just be like straightforward like from the beginning like why did you I, even have to beat around the bush i feel like it was going for a bit of the sort of run around neo-noir detective style a little bit like the kind of carryover 40s, 50s detective novel, detective movie kind of style of like, you're not going to get all the answers. People are just going to give you shit before they like you, before they're willing to be on your side. It happened in Chinatown a lot to Jack Nicholson's character. Fair enough. Like half, half the people that he became allied with at the start of the movie just straight up didn't like him, thought he was an asshole, told him to go fuck himself. So I, I don't know. Uh, damn, uh, Brody, what do you what do you think about it? Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> look, I, I think the story is, um, I think it's great. Um, even though it does have uh, the same elements as like pretty much any detective story, it's that basic structure. Um, but I think in a way it's visually told um, different. I mean, for the most part, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's got some uh, some sort of different aesthetic about it that I can't help put my finger on, but it works, and I'm and I'm very okay with that. So um, yeah, overall, um, yeah, I, I think it works extremely well. Like it's it's not a overly complicated script of the sorts. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. What about you, Mister Bowser? It's very unique in many ways, especially for <laughs> a film of its time. Yeah. Mm. So featuring a strong black lead as Shaft and then having him do all sorts of things and say such spicy things definitely riled up a few folks at the time, which I think led to the negative reviews. Because again, in the 70s, racism ran rampant still, mm. and it's disgusting and it's gross and fuck all those yeah. people. But anyway, onward and upward, uh, this film... I love the way that they play. Well, okay. They, how they Shaft uses the police as sometimes they get in the way, but it's more so they're a tool for Shaft to get information and knowledge that he isn't able to get on his own. So he uses as is not like, use. He uses their uh, their power for his own betterment, I guess. But in, uh, it's also mm -hmm. mentioned by his other people that people looked down upon him for using. The cops like that. Uh, I, I can't. I don't know what conversation it is, but they mention something about. Well, he does have his foot in the door with the whiteies, and I think that was referring to the cops. Uh, so that's definitely a different take, especially on this. And then to have this gang of New York to then go against the mafia. It was such an interesting contrast to see those types of films and those types of uh, styles clash on screen and then to have a strong hero character like John Shaft thrown in the mix. And then the story just plays out in such a cool way that really progresses each character evenly. And, we've, and we get enough appropriate time with each character. And I think it does its due diligence to explain their, each, each one of their motives and why they're there and why they do the things and why they act the way. I really love John's uh, one honey, the uh, the black lady that I, he lives with. I don't think it, it's his main squeeze, I guess. Uh, and then she's she's really strong as well. Her character is really very strong, especially for the time. She kind of uh, that that gang guy comes into her house and she uh, kind of bosses him around and takes control and really asserts herself that while you're in this house, you're going to listen to my rules. And it's it's very it's very cool to see that type of character written out. It's yeah. I love the story. I love how it ends. I love how Shaft throws away the cops at the end. It's like, well, I, I got what you, I wanted out of you to so fuck you. Roll the credits, baby. Uh, that was really cool for me. And yeah, I like how he takes a bunch of fucking bullets and gets back up so he can do that third, the third act. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he, I think he technically only got hit the once in the, in the shoulder. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, um, I'm going to wake you up so I can, so you can tell me where it hurts. It. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> man. No, it is great. I actually do really like that. You mentioned, you know, it explains all of their motives and everything because it's a movie that everyone, whether they be good or bad, mm -hmm. um, is not either 100% flawless. If they're the hero, you know, shaft still does have his faults and everything. He's not meant to be, perfect um even though he you know has the as Bertie said earlier in the additional info the the black superman uh, ideal around him and everything but then again even superman has faults um but like it's the fact that they're they're consistent they make decisions based on how that character would actually genuinely act a lot of what i see is 
even in detective movies, heist movies, things like that, that are similar to it, is characters will do 180s for no other reason than, well, this is what happens in the plot and we need to get from point A to point B. So this character is either going to have to just kind of flip or not. And it's, but they didn't have the appropriate character development too. Yeah. These characters all act consistently. They act realistically. They act how they would. And they're all just fucking cool, especially Shaft. Like he just, he stays true to himself yet. I think he does kind of get a little bit of a softer side, at least a little bit later on just with um, Bumpy's daughter trying to save her from the three guys in the hotel and everything, whenever he gets shot and he ends up taking the bullet for it. But at the same time, it wasn't like a particularly 100% heroic thing so much as he was trying to call the mafiosos bluff because he had no real other choice and ended up taking a bullet for it, which is realistic because like it could happen. I don't know. It just, that was another little takeaway I guess I had from it. I just really liked that the characters remained consistent. They remained true to how that character, I think, would act. Impact and takeaways, Brody Kane. Um, you know, uh, well, I, you know, having this film play a huge impact in the film history, especially of its time, um, with its uh, black exploitation themes, I, I think it's um, portrayed in a way that's not really like there are the majority of it can be seen as like it's forced but then again when you think about it in hindsight it's just a story where a guy wanted to make a um i see it as a black james bond that's that's basically what i took away from it and it, it was a film that really showcased the power of one and um what he could achieve with that power because as we could see out of the film you know you got the single guy doing this case he recruits um, people that he doesn't even really fucking know of. So, yeah, I think director Gordon Parks really wanted to tell his story um, and it definitely speaks for itself. And, I, yeah, I think what adds to it as well, that low budget quality too. I mean, he had to be really creative with this story and I think he's uh, hit the nail on the head with it, with, especially with this iconic character to this day. I mean, they're still making – fucking movies about him so yeah he came out like two years ago i think yeah pretty much samuel jackson Mm -hmm. and that was a direct sequel to the 2000 one that also had samuel jackson in it i believe okay yes nick anything you want to expand on that you haven't touched on already not a ton um i do think it was a an important movie uh especially for the time um it was a good thing that it kind of came out when it did tj did touch upon this a little bit earlier i don't want to get too political or anything with it um but at that certain point when it did come out um and it was mentioned kind of in the the interviews and everything um i agree a lot with what gordon parks said um that they kind of needed this sort of character and this sort of movie especially at the time early 1970s this is right after the sort of u.s civil rights act kind of things you know there's still not the best of blood between everybody at this certain point but you know you have a morally upright black character in an american movie maybe it didn't have the biggest budget but it's an mgm it was a major film release um and I, I mean it's not like it was the first ever film to feature a black lead 1968 or was it 66 uh george romero um you know Dwayne Jones. yeah i was say it, like it's not like it was the first but i do think that it was important to have another movie like this this expanded um, on what Dwayne Jones started on George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. This honestly, took- yeah. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, it really did. I think I actually kind of saw when I was looking for earlier black exploitation films because I knew this wasn't the first one. I did see, like in, I mentioned in the additional info, it, um, it was the first franchise, but it wasn't the first film. I think I actually saw um, Night of the Living Dead come up or at least be suggested to kind of be put in there. I don't really agree with that, but I do agree that it was an expansion kind of on that sort of late 60s cinema with having the sort of leads and having morally upright characters that people could like, you know, and Mm -hmm. people in neighborhoods, like they said, could come in and they'd have a hero. They'd have actually (laughs) someone that they could be proud to watch a movie and go, that's a character I like. And other people can like that too. And I just, I think it was good. I think it was important that it came out when it did. And I, I just, think it was a good thing period um but yeah i mean that's really about as much as i can do uh tj yourself 
this film had has so much influence on black cinema as a whole. And the character of John Shaft is so iconic to the community of filmmakers and just to everybody that is into horror noir or anything like that. It's well, film noir. It's just this film. You see it referenced a lot in black exploitation articles, and I've never seen it up till this point. And I have to say it's such a unique film. It it's, uh, stands out amongst so many other films. And this, this character of John Shaft, like we already mentioned, is almost like a natural progression of that strong black character that we see started in the Night of the Living Dead. So when you see him talk the way he... he he talks and acts the way he acts. It's it's so completely different from the norm of what was used to in cinema, especially for a black character at the time. So I think that in order f- in order for modern cinema to even be where it's at, this film had to happen. So you see, even like a uh, the more comedic take, Black Dynamite, what this film had influenced on that, and Michael Jai White's writing with that uh, character. Yeah, mm. it's just it's just nuts. I I I absolutely love this movie and. I went in with with high hopes and more of like a blind optimism, and I was pleasantly surprised with uh, the expectations that I had, and it, it blew me away. Uh, I will I will have to say that I wish that the cinematography was better. I feel like it, it lacked the pizzazz that I'm used to and that I want from my films. I, I think that the writing is super solid. I love the dialogue interactions. It's just so unique and so wonderful. Uh, <laughs> wonderful in the sense because it's so unique and it's so in your face and direct. It's yeah. I, I'd say for some of you uh, sketchy fucks, it would make you uncomfortable, but it's uh, it's pretty rad. So we're going to rate this, boys, and we're going to rate this strong black male leads out of five because this movie's got tons. <laughs> Brody? I'm going to give it a 3.5. Nick? Uh, 3.8. I'm going to give it a 3.5. That has a lights, camera, exploitation score of 3.6. Strong black male leads out of five. So, ladies and germs, next episode is The Amusement Park from 1972. George A. Romero's last PSA. I'm excited to talk about it. It is now streaming on Shudder. I was happy to be able to witness the initial uh, live stream of that film, followed up by the uh, the Q&A with the Garf Network, Fangoria, a expert on horror noir, and the lady who did was in charge of the restoration of the film. And of course, Susan Romero. It's just, it's exciting to talk about. I can't wait to talk about it. I'm not going to say anything more because these boys haven't seen it yet. And it's just 51 minutes of some of the most terrifying shit I've ever witnessed. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about it next week. And if you guys want to hear more content like this, head on over to projectlouder.net, your source for pop culture and so much more. Check out other great podcasts on there. You can listen to those on Spotify, Google Play, Audible, or anywhere else that you listen to audio only content. I'd say that's all I have till next week. This is your pod box. TJ Bowser, signing off. This is your doppelganger, Kangan Banger, all the way from down under saying, Sayonara, bitches. Like Nick, here's I am. I love each and every one of your faces. Bye bye. Bye.
impressive. Thank you, Shaft. Thank you. Not as impressive as Bobby's cock. A <laughs> <laughs> <That> mobster. <laughs> uh, gotta see the cock on that guy. <laughs> uh, <Not> Bobby. <laughs> Bobby's penis just come to my mind. <laughs> oh, man. Man, Bobby's going to be known for shafts now. Right? <laughs> or at least the length of his. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh.